Hello and welcome to Strides Forward, where we share stories about running told by women. I am Cherie Louise Turner, your host and producer, and before we get into this story, I want to let you know that this episode is sponsored by The Feed, the number one online resource for supplements and nutritional needs for athletes like you. The Feed was created by Athletes for Athletes, so you can rest assured that all the products that you find there have been tested and curated and approved by the athletes at The Feed. Their interest is your performance as well as their own. And there's a huge variety to choose from. There are over 200 brands represented at The Feed. So this is your one-stop shop for nutrition and supplementation for your athletic performance needs. If you're looking for gels, hydration, mixes, bars, all of it, you can find it at The Feed. So shopthefeed.com. And as a part of this sponsorship, you can claim $80 in feed credit today. Just go to thefeed.com forward slash forward. Yes, that's a forward slash and the word forward, F-O-R-W-A-R-D, to claim your $80 in feed credit today. And enjoy shopping at The Feed. Now, on to the episode. Yeah, I think it's cool. I think we need to rewrite the script for what it means to be over 50 as a female. And I think I'm not the only one, but there's a number of women over 50 that we're just charging it. And we're, we're in good shape, but we're, we're owning who we are. And I think this generation of us women over 50, they're out there in various sports. They're like, hello. Oh, yes. Hello. And welcome to Strides Forward, where we share stories about running told by women. Each episode, we share the story of one woman's running journey, focusing on topics that are core to that journey. I am Cherie Louise Turner, the host and producer of Strides Forward, and I'm going to let this fantastic runner introduce herself. Hi, my name is Verity Breen. I'm originally from Australia. I grew up in a place called the Sutherland Shire, very sporting community, spent a lot of time in Queensland and fell in love with an American and I'm in America and I've been here for 12 years uh, and I'm 55 years of age. So certainly a topic we'll get into with Verity's story is aging as an athlete. Especially because not only does Verity continue to be passionate about competition and pushing her limits, she's committed herself to a whole new realm of the sport. She's currently transitioning from road marathons to trail ultra marathons. And she's bringing decades of running experience and successes, as well as some failures, with her. Verity has run well over 100 marathons, as well as 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, and ultras. She's won numerous state titles in Australia, and she's been the Australian national champion in the marathon and the 50-kilometer road race, which is about 31 miles. She's represented her home country at both the 50K Road World Championships and the Mountain Running World Championships, and as you'll hear, in her earlier days when she was competing in triathlon in the Olympic distance races, she was a member of the Australian World Championship team for 20 to 25-year-olds. This is all to say, Verity understands how to prepare for and execute peak performances at an elite level. And that's a deeply held interest and passion that hasn't diminished over time. It's also a drive Verity can easily trace back to her youth, which is where we'll begin her story. Well, I grew up in a household as the youngest of four adopted children, um, which you know I'm very thankful for. I love my siblings. Um, it was. It was interesting because I, I realised, I don't know how I knew to do this, but I realised that who I was as opposed to where I was was a little different. So I started, you know, just trying to identify with who who I am in terms of not finding myself but just sort of becoming comfortable with the things I was interested in. I did things when I looked back it, and um, it was always there, there, this fascination with um, innate timing self-determined adventures 
I decided that I didn't want to stand on the corner for longer than it needed to be for the bus. So I had a plan and I would look at the kitchen clock and I would race out the front door, down the front steps, down to the corner and I wanted to arrive as soon as the bus came around the corner and I was always thought that was so cool if I got there at that exact point. Um, every now and again I miss the bus. The bus was early. <laughs> so I go home with my bag like I was about eight and I'd just not go in the back door. My mum would be there and I'd say, oh, and she'd say, you missed the bus. And i go, this only happened about three times. So the odds, you know, I had a pretty good scoreboard. Yeah, you know, she'd drive me to school. Also, I would go around the big block and then the large block of where we lived in Engadine. My mum would be drinking a beer. That's what you do in Australia in, in summer, in the afternoon, waiting for my father to come home. And she'd, you know, be knitting or drinking a cold beer. And I couldn't see the kitchen clock from, from the back door. She could. And I'd say to her, I'm leaving right now. What's the time? And she'd say, 5.05. And I'd say, when I come in the back door, as soon as I don't give her these instructions, like so funny, as soon as I open the sliding door, you need to tell me exactly what time it is. And she'd nod. Later on, she told me half the time she wasn't paying attention. You know, she said she'd, she'd either make it up or, you know, I was satisfied. So I was time trialling through the bush to get to tennis on Saturday so I wouldn't have to go all the way around the road and that was sort of scary for me because I had to go through the bush and the clay pit and my new tennis joggers, but it saved me half an hour. So I looked back and I was already doing it and, I, and I've become very good at it as a, as a marathon runner in particular, but I was doing it then. I was cutting tangents, time trialling, innate timing, uh, which is my way of describing what I taught myself uh, which is knowing your pace internally. So it's having a very, very kind of clear and concise um, handle on understanding your pace and what pace you're in. All my early racing, which is prolific with marathoning and all that, um, was done watch-free. So, so I taught myself to know, like, I'm at 4.30 pace, four you know, if you're talking kilometres, say we're in America, which we are now, I know if I'm at 6, 6.15, 6.45, 7, 8, I can feel it. It's kind of cool. It takes a while to be able to teach yourself how to do it, but it's it's a very good asset. So I had this this innate consistency. If I decided to do something, I would work out how to do it, and I would do it. My parents couldn't come to all the games. So whatever sport I decided to play, the deal was my dad would give me the money. He was an accountant, by the way. And he would say to me, if you don't finish the season, don't ask me for the, for the money again. So I also became a finisher of things because that meant I could do the next sport or whatever it is. But I had to get myself there and get myself home. So as an athlete, when I became a marathon runner, People would often say to me, how did you get to Singapore and Mumbai and India and all these places? And I just became, I think the childhood became the narrative, the backbone that set me up as an adult when I went into doing triathlon and running. So as Verity was going through her childhood years, she was setting herself up to be a competitive athlete in her adult years. And as she noted here, that competitive career started out in triathlon, which she was inspired to do through a series of unexpected events. Then I got a a serious boyfriend. I was very late to the table on dating, big tomboy, really. Then we got engaged. So this is the important piece. So he was doing triathlon and I was following him. Let's call him, we we don't want to call him his real name. So let's call him Bob. I fell in love with Bob. We were both teaching aerobics. I was following Bob around to all his tr- triathlon training and participating because I was pretty fit. Then we got engaged. Oh, wait for it. Um, had the engagement party. Bought a house and were seven months away from being married. And, oh, my God, Bob told me he didn't want to get married anymore. And I was like, totally gutted and thinking oh my god it was more like having the 
like everything you imagine in your mind that was about to happen was not happening. And I was 22. So anyway, Bob apparently was had been racing around with, let's call her Jane. So Jane's out there. I'm just trying to think of another name. Of oh, God. Uh, so this is when I kind of like really kind of became pretty more empowered. So he married uh, Jane on our wedding day and used the same booking, which is bizarre. So let's just scale it back a bit. I had engagements over or whatever, the wedding's over. I had a bundle of cash. I said, just give me back the money I put into the house. Here's your rings. I was, I couldn't believe, I was very pragmatic at 22, which is amazing. And, but you know what I did? I went to the house and I said, I want to meet her in this house we bought. And I think this was a pivotal moment in my life as a female is saying, I am going to get closure on this and I am going to move on. (laughs) So I did that and it was really hard but it was really cool because I got back in the car I had bought and now I had a car, took a deep breath and thought, oh, okay. So then I bought a triathlon bike, I bought some shoes and then I started doing triathlon. Yeah, and then it's like my whole life changed. I mean – it was really epic. Uh, it was, you know, I don't look back at the broken engagement and all that as a negative. It, it changed my life. So that's 1989. Two years later, I had uh, done the required races uh, that were needed to be put f- towards selection for the Australian 2025 20, team and had made the team for the Olympic Distance World Championships. Then I was training with a coach. His name is Brett Sutton. Uh, I found him a very strange character, but he had all the best athletes at the time. That was the group on the Gold Coast in Australia where the majority of people went. And it was a very flagellistic culture as far as I'm concerned now. And then when I realised he would just push and push and push and it was like a churn, you know, it was like a big churn and he was looking for the diamonds and he, he produced some great athletes, but he also destroyed um, far more, I believe, in my mind than he produced. And uh, I became a casualty of that. I got a, a soft tissue situation with my left foot and it was a really bad, you know, I would say it was a repetitive strain and I just, you know, really got myself in a bad way. So I left and uh, I had X amount of time to to get ready for this World Championship Triathlon Olympic distance. Now, I didn't go into that Australian team as fit as I wanted to be, but I got myself back in pretty good shape and I got the foot good. And I realised after this how powerful it was to take ownership of my own uh, training. And then it was just a game changer. I was more self-determined and I realised I was able to organise the sessions I needed around having a full-time job then. And I just thought this is really where where I want to go. And I also looked back at my childhood and I felt like my desire to do this was innate, that I was already self-determined. I was already pretty forensic by nature, very interested in knowing how to do it myself. And I've always learned very well that way, Um, very hands-on. And I decided that that would be where I would head. And then I left the triathlon to build a running career. And I've never looked back. So Verity made the decision to self-coach, which is something she does to this day. It's a practice of staying educated in her sport, listening closely to signals from her body and reacting accordingly, looking holistically at the demands and stresses of her life and how those interact with her training, setting clear goals and identifying specifically what she needs to do to reach those goals, and, as she says, forensically examining the process of continuing to excel in the different challenges she sets for herself, working, as we all do, with a body that changes over time. Also, as Verity hinted at there, she did leave the world of triathlon for running. Some rule changes in the sport of triathlon had her considering where she might best continue to excel in her athletic pursuits. I had started really realizing I could run. Like I, 
I obviously, you know, I was running around doing strange running, you know, adventures as a kid intermittently, but I would get off the bike and I was like a slingshot. And then I just made a very clear decision and it was a very, very good decision. I thought, you're a way better runner than you'll ever be a triathlete. So I'm coming into running and I'm coming into my later 20s. So I just went all in. How do I become an elite runner? And it didn't happen overnight, but guess what? It really did happen. <laughs> so <laughs> it was awesome. And I first thing I did was to find a group and there was these men that were running and they were older and they were hard asses. I mean, these guys were real, real deal on the Gold Coast. I turned up and they were, they were marathoners. They were known and I said, do you mind if I train with you? And Laurie Adams looked up and up and down and he said, well, the last girl that came here, you know, goes, lasted six weeks. Sure. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, so I would go there every Tuesday, Thursday, track on the grass, rough, rough grass track. And I was with those guys for years. These guys, I don't know how to describe them, but they're just awesome. And they really just, they weren't, they never mollycoddled me. There was no special favours, right, at all. And so it hardened me. I went to Rotorua Marathon. I thought, I want to go <laughs> I want to go overseas for my first marathon. All, the only money I could afford was to go to New Zealand. But it was awesome. And I ran this New Zealand marathon, no watch, finished in uh, 318 something. And I was pretty happy. And they had this presentation afterwards and I wanted to watch, watch it all and watch the winners. And then they called my name out. This is a pivotal moment. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Why are they calling my name out? And the people I was with from Gold Coast Runners Club were elbowing me like, that's you. And I'm like, what, what did I get? And uh, I got the rookie trophy. I was like, what? I was so excited. I mean... I swear to God, I was, I was, I'm a million tears now remembering. I was like, I got a trophy. <laughs> and I got the fastest novice. I was so happy. And I'm like, yes. So there's moments where, you know, I just, just started just building up my confidence. And yeah, and then uh, I just kept chipping away at the road racing. Hi, I'm Christina Yerling Biro, host of the podcast Pop Culture Confidential. Join me as I go way behind the scenes with some of the most influential people in entertainment and media. Hear actors such as Succession's Brian Cox talk about his favorite characters to play. There always has to be a mystery. The audience have to be in a situation where they want to know what's going on. Meet studio execs like Pixar chief Pete Docter and learn his secret on how he makes us cry. Emotion is our first language. And so many others who are defining popular culture, from Obama speechwriter David Litt to Top Chef host Padma Lakshmi. We don't often think about food politically or we don't want to, but it really is. Join me. Search for Pop Culture Confidential wherever you get your podcasts. So I was at the point of wanting to win a state title, which is a Noosa Marathon, so still early in. I made the grave mistake retrospectively. I stayed with a very nice older couple who offered me a bed the night before. And they said, what do you eat? And I said, well, I'm gluten-free. You know, just didn't want to be too much trouble. They went ahead and made a meal for me that was so bad. God bless them. It was so bad. And I was like, oh, no, I can't eat this. <laughs> it was really and, – and then there's no stores open. I didn't know enough then to bring food, extra food, you know, like I don't know. Yeah, so the carbo loading, the whole thing was out the window and I just thought I'll be fine. No, I was not fine. I was in the lead until by three miles to go and the wall, the wall, first and only time it's happened to me in a marathon, um, <laughs> I, the wall came for me and I was in the lead. And so I want to make this clear. If you won the state title, you also won a trip to Japan. <laughs> I really, really, really wanted to go to Japan. Bad. So I'm like, oh, my God, 
oh no, what's happening to me in my mind? Because I don't know, I don't know what the wall is yet, but I know that something is happening to me and it's bad. And I was really, really hungry. So all my reserves had gone. So then I was in such a state that if someone dropped half a piece of food from the disco from the night before on the way home, half a hot dog, a falafel, I was looking for food on the ground. I was like literally, because aid stations were not a thing. There was aid stations, but they were just water, you know. But look, I made it in. I somehow hung in there mentally, but it's like an out-of-body experience because in my mind I was clear, but my body was not aligned with your mind. So when you hit the wall, your body and your mind, if someone hasn't been there, the only way I can explain it is they're doing two very different things. <laughs> the way you think you look and feel is not the way you look. You look like a total space cadet. <laughs> you know. So I come in and I come into the finish line and I'm like totally off my brain, like I'm just out of it. And these women are trying to kind of help me and they're like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And they're like, um, I think you need to sit down. And I'm like, I'm okay. <laughs> and then all I kept asking them was, did I win, right? And they're like, yes, you did. And I go, did I win the trip? Did I get the trip? <laughs> So then I went to Japan. Here's the clincher. I had been chasing the sub three. I'd gone from debut marathon 318 and three months later, Gold Coast Marathon, went back to the drawing board, ran on a fast course. Three months later, second marathon was 301. So I've just knocked a chunk of change off. And then this, so this is when I thought, wait, hang on, this is happening. I can do this. Then that, that trip to Japan I won while hitting the wall, beautiful, beautiful experience. And the universe gifted me with breaking sub three in Osaka, in, in this race in Japan, on a, on a red carpet. <laughs> so they rolled, they had this red carpet and I was like, oh, my God, yes. And so, look, what happens is you have these pivotal moments. I remember demanding my elite bib from a very nice woman who ran the Sydney City to Surf. It's Australia's hands down largest road race and it goes from Sydney CBD all the way down to Bondi Beach. The starts, the elite and seated and sub-elite starts taken very seriously. You have to qualify for it specifically. One of my big goals was to earn an elite start at the start of this race. And it took a very long time, but I did it. And they sent me the sub-elite and I got this thing in the mail. I'm like, no. So I asked for her and I rang her up and I said, I've worked really hard on achieving the time required to get the elite bib and you sent me this. And she's like, well, da, 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 da. I said, no, 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 no. I want what I earned. And so I think I started doing that too, like holding my ground, going after what I wanted. She sent it and I got it. And I remember standing there that morning with the helicopters flying around right up the front and I've got 40,000 people behind me. But the thing is, it's like I've had many moments where the little girl, you know, kid from Engadine, I'm like, damn, you know, for me personally, um, you don't ask, you don't get. And I think my career was based on and my journey still and now is these moments where you think, I, I, I got here. I arrived at this point. Um, <clears throat> I remember running in a Mumbai marathon thinking, oh, my God, like this is surreal, right? Meeting the king of Thailand after the Bangkok marathon. I didn't even know who he was. I asked the girl in, from America that came third because we were on a top five podium I said <laughs> I leaned in and I said who's the dude in the tracksuit you know <laughs> she's looking at me like oh my god you moron and she says it's the king of Thailand and I was like oh god you know <laughs> and I'm like wow right he gives me this giant medal super heavy puts it over my head then they told us to go to a table and we got this envelope full of cash and it was like there's all these funny moments Verity's career has been full of funny moments, pivotal moments, great races, as well as races that did not go well at all. 
She's had times of feeling great and going good, and other times when things just weren't clicking. And through all of it, she examined and learned and kept at her pursuit of running excellence, which she's maintained. But as the years have marched on, so, of course, has Verity's age. And with that, other people's perceptions of what they think she's capable of have changed which she experienced in no uncertain terms at the 2012 Nike Women's Marathon and Half Marathon in San Francisco, where she lined up to run her specialty, the full 26.2 miles of the marathon. So I go down, put myself at the start line, and I'm like, okay, let's go. No watch, no phone, nothing. Not my goose. So we roll out, and I'm... You know, and I'm pretty experienced by now. I'm 46 and I'm thinking I'm not going to make a move until I work out who's in the half and who's in the full. I also knew the field, the half marathons went one way and then at some point we went the other way, right? So then I move up, the field splits and I'm thinking, wait, I'm, uh, I must be in the top five here, right? So then going through Golden Gate Park, I come up against one of the girls alongside her and I listen to the breathing. I'm not wearing my earbuds, I don't wear music. And I'm like, well, she's a little out of her comfort zone because she's breathing a lot heavier than I am. I'm like, okay, well, I think we can move on here. So I take her, you know, see another girl come alongside her. So I do these sort of assessments, like how are they looking, how are they feeling, how am I feeling? Then I move into first. Now, I was in first for ages, it felt like ages, on my own, just hauling it. Okay, so three miles to go. Someone, a spectator, says 30 seconds and that meant that there's someone behind me. And I'm like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I've come all this way. I won. I love double espresso goo. This is not a plug for goo. I just like them and they work for me. So I pulled out what I call my final grenade, which I needed. And I'm like, let's pull the pin on this. And I had some gas left. That's another thing. You've got to save some gas in case there's a battle. I'm like, well, here we go. It's going to be a battle. I'm ready for the battle. So I took this and I just started lifting the pace. And I'm like, whoever it is, if she's coming, she's coming. I can't stop it, but I'm ready for it. But I held her off. But then I saw the clock over the finish line. And I'm like, hello, no watch on. And I wanted to break three hours as well. I, I just wanted to have a really good race and break three hours. I was not expecting to win. Yeah, so I ran sub three. Now, here's the thing. The first question I got asked was from a female reporter and I'm just finished and processing what just happened. And she says, oh, my God, hi. And I went, oh, hi. And, like, you know, and she says to me, how old are you? And I'm like, oh, you know what I did? I said, come on. I did. I said, come on. Is that really your first question? I said, it's okay, but still. I said, I'm 46. Then I had this picture of me when I put my finger up in the air. And actually, this makes me a little emotional and even talking now because I kind of pointed and I said, and for any woman out there that's over 40, this is still your future. You can still, you know, you can win races or whatever. You know, I was like, and, and she was nice. And, okay, there was a little interview. And then, so, so. But they gave me this giant box, this giant Tiffany box they gave me. And all these lovely younger women who had done the half, they're like, oh, my God, what's in the box? And I said, oh, I have no idea. And they're like, oh, well, how did you get it? And I said, oh, I won it. And they go, how? And I go, well, I won the, I won the race. And they're like, which race? <laughs> You know, it was really weird. And I said, well, I won the marathon. And they go, and I just could see the look on their face. And they're like, wow. And, and they, you know, and they said, how old are you? And I go, well, I'm 46. And so I think for me, this is a pivotal moment in me saying to myself, you have to start addressing that this is your new reality. This is your new reality. You're an older athlete and how people view you and what they think you're capable of is not the same as it used to be. What hadn't changed, however, was Verity's drive to challenge herself and by extension continue to challenge other people's perceptions of what a woman her age can do. 
Like she said at the very, very beginning of the story, she thinks we need to rewrite the script of what it means to be over 50 as a female. And she's doing that now by taking on the entirely new challenge of ultra-distance trail running, which in her case arrived in a totally unexpected but not completely unwelcome way. I promised myself years ago, silently, that I would not even look at 50 mile, 100k, 100 mile, anything like that till I was in my 50s. No way, Jose. And I had guys in Australia who know me very well over the many years who'd say to me, you'll be really good at this. You should do it. You should do it. And I'm like, yeah, nah. <laughs> so here I am and weirdly enough, it was just totally out of the blue. This acquaintance of mine somehow got two tickets to Western States, which is probably unheard of. And she wants to give this ticket to me. So uh, was accepting that a good idea or a bad idea? Because who's not going to? I'm like, this is so random. This is 2021. It kind of it kind of propelled me into it head first. All right. I want to jump in here to say that getting an entry out of the blue to the Western States 100-mile trail race is definitely unusual, to put it mildly. If you know the process of getting into Western States, you understand how wildly rare getting handed an entry is. If you aren't familiar with the entry process for states, the broad strokes are, for most people, you have to go through a lottery system and getting an entry can take the better part of a decade. I am not exaggerating. There is another way to get in if you're an elite racer. You can win an entry by getting what's called a golden ticket. These are gifted to top placing runners at a handful of very competitive ultra races. So yes, who's going to say no to this once in a lifetime opportunity? While Verity wasn't yet totally steeped in the ultra trail community, this was something she understood well. But it is a big leap between running and racing, marathons, and even 50Ks on the road, to trying to tackle 100 miles on the trails. And indeed, in the end, Verity would not end up having her hoped-for day at Western States. She'd miss the cutoff time at mile 85, a mere 15 miles from the finish. Her race was over. But preparing for Western States did inspire her to dive full bore into competitive trail running, which has totally changed the trajectory of her competitive pursuits. Now, last year I got absolute, oh, everything but the book thrown at me in nearly every lead-up race that I did finish, regardless of all the stuff that happened, lightning, chased by cows, multiple falls. I mean, I just got you know, total, excuse the language, ass-kicking. I mean, and so here's the thing, road racing, it doesn't happen. In road racing, you don't, fall over and think you've broken your ribs. You don't um, get stuck in mud that's coming over the top of your shoes and think it's the most hateful experience of your life. You don't get chased by cows during training and think that you're going to die. So, so I think I've kind of weirdly avoided it because I'm used to this flow state and, you know, niceness of, of road racing very the only thing that could go wrong that would be a tragedy was you miss the aid station cup and drop it or someone stands on your shoe or your goo falls on the ground and you don't want to pick it up. Yeah, but I was running. I just, I just think, oh, God, I think what's really blown my mind annoyingly am falling in love with the sport because – the kid, the kid that cut through the clay pit, the kid that did the time trialling, the kid that, that packed her little lunches and took herself off to the bush has kind of has come to life. And also it's challenging me on every goddamn level, right? And I, a part of me thinks it's it, – I think it's the stoicism, the stoicism that ultra running brings to you as an individual – is something that is very, very, very different from road racing and the acceptance of pain. And I'm not, I don't believe in, in flagellistic ideas of pushing through and you know, hurting yourself. But, you know, there's times that I've fallen and I've been like, God, God damn it, I'm so mad. Like at first, what's interesting to me, at first I was like so mad when I fell. I was like, God, 
it's so, it's so, you know, we, we all know what it's like. It hurts like hell, right? You hope you haven't broken anything or broken a tooth or who knows. Um, and you get up and what's interesting is that I have fallen recently and I was just sort of sat there and I didn't get angry and I was like, oh. And I just sort of stood up and I thought, wow, look at you, <laughs> not scussing like a champion. And, you know, I mean, I was just like, kind of like, okay, all right, I'm okay. The, the transition that you go through, the camaraderie, also the beauty. Like I stood in the middle of some races or training and I thought, God, this is so beautiful, you know. Now that's pretty neat. I, I'm getting better at it. Like this year, I've what I call doing a reframing, and I'm I've totally recalibrated. I've totally gone back to dumping the technology, which for me just works. I started having to say, like, what are my the glaring weaknesses mentally and physically for me? And I thought, for sure, running nimbly downhill was not one of my assets and I had to work out how the hell to do that and learning oh hiking how hiking up things not running up things like when do I run when do I hike right and uh fear of falling you know I mean it the, the falling thing I have a probably marginal fear of heights I don't know why and then I also worked on my leg turnover because the way I run on the road is very very different to now how I know how I need to run on the trail so I taught myself on the roads to have many different pace lengths and turnovers so the way I run a five a ten a half and a marathon are not the same and so I also say to to road runners doesn't help to be what I call a one gear wonder like you have to have gears and I do think in ultras for me what I've realised this year is I'm, I'm coming in now with gears. I'm, I'm now going out and training and developing the gears and I'm now bringing them to the races and I'm already seeing a great deal of improvement. It's just really, really interesting to me and I can't just walk away now because now I'm thinking, okay, and it's like I have to just delete the idea that I'm 55. I, I, can't, I can't look at that. I have to say whatever. But I'm now like, okay, how far can I push this envelope, right? Um, how much better can I get? Would it, be, would it be wild to chase a golden ticket? But, yeah, so I think I'm, I'm feeling kind of excited about it and um, I'm setting goals and I am falling in love with the sport and I'm falling in love with the people in the sport and the stories and it's a whole different – so I still – look, uh, here we go, but I do – still accept that I am an outlier, I'm not in the club, I'm on the fringes and that's okay and I'm good with that but I'm, I'm getting to know people and I have so much respect for people that are just really inspiring and, and encouraging and um, it doesn't, I think what I'm trying to say is that just because you're good at running in general, when you come into trails, it's a whole other world. But it's a really cool world, right? And I, I, I think I could say I, I, I love it. Wow, what an incredible journey. Thank you so much to Verity for being willing to share your experiences and everything that you've learned. And thank you for continuing to rewrite the script on what aging can look like for women. For me personally, it is truly my greatest joy to shine the light on women who are showing through example what we are capable of far beyond the often very limiting traditional role models that have been handed to us. Women who are, as the saying goes, being the future they want to see. Verity is doing just that through her drive and love of competitive running, and it is super cool. And to use a word that gets overused but is absolutely appropriate here, she is truly inspiring. 
And if you want to continue to be inspired by Verity, you can find her on Instagram at Verity underscore Breen. And you can check out her website, Veritybreen.com. She's also on Facebook. So thank you again, Verity. And thank you to you. You being here and listening to these stories is what gives them power. And I really appreciate it. I would also really, really love if you would share the podcast with a friend or two or maybe your whole running crew. Word of mouth is so powerful for independent shows like ours, and your recommendation really makes a difference to us. So thank you. And of course, you can share those recommendations on social media. We would love it if you did. And please tag us. We are at Strides Forward on Twitter and on Instagram. You can also find us on Facebook. And of course, I do not make this show by myself. Cormac O'Regan makes all of the original music for the show, and he does the sound design. He does that from his studio in Cork, Ireland. April Mariner of Bonfire Collaborative does all the design work for the show, the website, merch, social media, all of it. And April comes to you from Truckee, California, and you can find her at bonfirecollaborative.com. And yes, I am Cherie Louise Turner, the host and producer of Strides Forward. And as always, I am coming to you from a closet in Somerville, Massachusetts. Thank you again for listening. And until next time, we all wish you many healthy, joyful strides forward. I'm Christina Yerling Biro, host of the podcast Pop Culture Confidential. Join me as I go way behind the scenes with some of the most influential people in entertainment and media. Hear actors such as Succession's Brian Cox talk about his favorite characters to play. There always has to be a mystery. The audience have to be in a situation where they want to know what's going on. Meet studio execs like Pixar chief Pete Docter and learn his secret on how he makes us cry. Emotion is our first language. And so many others who are defining popular culture, from Obama speechwriter David Litt to Top Chef host Padma Lakshmi. We don't often think about food politically or we don't want to, but it really is. Join me. Search for Pop Culture Confidential wherever you get your podcasts.